On my 19th birthday, in September 2014, I moved into my first home. A small one-bed flat, I was beyond excited to have the freedom and independence that living alone would offer me and quickly set about buying new furniture, decorations, and items for my home. One afternoon, on the bus ride home, after a trip into my local town to buy more household items, an elderly gentleman in his late 60s, if I had to guess, started speaking to me. I've always been a social person that will gladly speak to whoever speaks to me, so I engaged him in conversation. Just polite chit-chat about what we've been up to that day, what our plans were for the rest of it. Upon reaching the stop, I'd be getting off at. He told me he was also getting off at the stop as he was visiting a friend who lived in a neighboring block of flats. He offered to carry my shopping, and I agreed. I walked with him to the front of my block and said my goodbyes. He left towards a different block, and I thought that was that. He didn't enter my building or see which flat belonged to me, or so I thought. A few days later, I heard a knock upon my door. I opened it to find the same elderly gentleman standing outside my door. I was quite taken aback, considering he should have known which flat I actually lived in. He also managed to get in the building without ringing my doorbell. The realization hit me. He must have hidden out of sight to see which flat I entered. He quickly forced his way into my home and tried talking to me. I lied and stated I was about to leave as my friends were expecting me, hoping this would encourage him to go. He then started groping me under my clothes and underwear. I moved his hands away but he kept trying to remove my clothes. I ran to my front door and told him I'm leaving now. You need to go. Luckily he did, but loitered. I waited to make sure he'd walk away before walking in an opposite direction and immediately calling my dad in tears. We rang the police, who were as helpful as they could possibly be. Two female officers who asked me, why did you let him in to the flat? Despite me saying he'd force his way in, they encouraged me to not press charges, as the name and address he'd given me in our first exchange were falsified, telling me it would be difficult to prove. A lot of paperwork. You would have to relive it in court if we managed to find him. I regretfully agreed. I was shocked and scared, and the police already were so unsupportive. It doesn't end there, though. This man continued to stalk me for months, regularly appearing at my door, following me when I was out. It wasn't until he was on the same bus as me to town when I went to meet friends that it finally stopped. As this was the first time, I was able to point him out to someone. My friends went over and publicly called him out for stalking and harassing me. They threatened him, saying, If we ever hear of you doing this again, you'll not be able to use those arms to abuse another person again. Leave our friend, the F alone. He quickly scampered away. That's the last I ever saw of him. But this incident shook me. It all happened simply because I was polite to a seemingly innocent elderly man who wanted to help me out and make conversation. Needless to say, I've never accepted another offer of helping me. Carry my shopping. Be careful who you let help you. It might not be good intentions they have in mind. Yesterday, while we're turning home from my work, I was exhausted and strayed from my routine way back home and I decided to sit down on a bench at a small park. The park was empty at the time. About five minutes later, a young man, I'd say in his late 20s to early 30s, dressed in a business suit, holding a briefcase, sat in the bench across from me and started to occasionally stare at me. Later on, he got up and sat next to me on the bench and said, How are you, Jennifer? Now, Jennifer is not my first name, but I'll use it as a placeholder. He had a British accent, and he was speaking in a very exaggerated manner. I was surprised and thought this was someone from my college or high school that I did not remember at the time. And when I asked how he knew my name, he simply replied, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then put his briefcase to his lap and clasped his hands on top of the briefcase. At this point, I started to feel worried and asked him again, how he knew me, but before I could finish my sentence, he interrupted me and said, I will get into it in a little while, but first, let me ask you, are you satisfied with where you are living right now? And then just said, my entire address 
He then said, What are your thoughts on your workplace? Are you satisfied with your wage? And then correctly stated my wage. At this point, I started to get really creeped out by him and asked him who he was again. And he calmly replied, It does not matter at this point. I don't recall what exactly he said. Right now, what matters is that I want to help you. He then went on to state a lot of personal information about me that I would think no one would ever know. And he especially knew about a lot of my personal relationships, about people that I know. As he was saying all this stuff, I started to pack my things and got up from the bench and asked who he was and what he wanted in a worried manner. He didn't answer me and told me to calm down. I then yelled at him and asked him what the F he wanted from me and who he was. And he didn't say anything and did this very weird thing where he rolled his eyes first and then slowly turned his head behind as if someone was standing behind him and just said, very well then. The way he did that was very strange, almost as if he was a character giving the camera a side eye and breaking the fourth wall. He picked up his briefcase, got up from the bench, and started to approach me. I tried to reach for the pepper spray in my bag, but he grabbed my arm and said, no need for that. Push me away. I lost my balance, fell to the ground, and he quickly walked away. I was really scared after falling to the ground and didn't know what to do for a solid minute. When I got back up, I went the way he walked away, but I didn't see him and decided just to get out of the park and go home. Overall, his mannerisms were very strange and he used his hands in an elegant manner a lot when he talked, like as if he was a theatrical actor. And as I say before, he spoke in a British accent. I live in the US and spoke theatrically as well. He was very tall, very well dressed, clean shaven, had short slicked hair and was wearing circular glasses. Another detail that I noticed was that he had this square pin on the lapel of his blazer. The pin was white and it had a little black trident on it. I haven't went to the police yet and I intend to ASAP, but I really don't know what to say or what evidence to provide apart from a small wound on my hand. Is there a place where I can ask for some advice about what to do about this situation? Also, I apologize for the way I wrote this. My mind is a mess right now. I just got back from a family vacation in Los Cabos, Mexico. We stayed at a nice western resort and usually around 9.30 p.m. My family would head back to the rooms to go to sleep. Naturally, as a 25-year-old, I wanted to stay up and party or go drinking at bars. But my older brother was working remotely and wouldn't go out with me. After the family went to bed, I went out to a bar around the corner from my hotel and ended up befriending the locals there and a 29-year-old guy from San Diego named Luke who was there for a wedding. We started hanging out every night after my family went to sleep, and on the third night of the trip, Luke asked if I wanted to meet him in downtown Los Cabos with his friends. I really wanted to, but was at an important dinner with the family that went on later than usual. I ended up staying home that night. The next night, I met him at this huge Pablo Escobar-esque mansion. They rented on Airbnb, and he told me that it was good. I couldn't make it out the night before because of how scary of an experience it was. He explained to me that the night before, his body was taking a piss outside and someone approached him and held out a key with a bump of coke on it. Without thinking, he snored the bump and the person who offered it was now demanding he buy an $80 bag from them. He was drunk and refused while getting pretty aggressive towards him. Things went from bad to worse as a Mexican who offered the bump started following their group from bar to bar for the next three hours, taking pictures of them. He called his friends, and there were now a group of them following behind and claiming to be affiliated with the cartel. They warned that if Luke's buddy didn't pay them, they were going to call their boss. Luke eventually went over and tried to smooth things over. They told him his friend had stolen from them, and it was going to cost him his life if someone didn't pay up. 
The cartel member also pulled his shirt up, revealing a 9mm pistol in his waistband. Luke did the right thing and remained calm, while offering to take them to an ATM and pay out of pocket 160 US so they could all be left alone. The cartel members gave him an empty coke bag and abruptly left, even after him doing all this for his friend's safety. His friend denied any responsibility or wrongdoing, even had the audacity to blame Luke for trying to help by getting involved. He also didn't offer Luke a single dollar. After this event happened, Luke got robbed again in the same night with a girl who ripped his $200 gold necklace right off his neck. His friend was cool to me, but sounded like a real a-hole. After Luke explained this to me, poor dude was only trying to be a good friend and was met with no gratitude, only to be robbed again. Needless to say, I am very happy I didn't make it out to meet them that night. I also think things could have gotten a lot worse for them had he not offered the cartel members money. Be careful out there and never accept free drugs from a stranger on the street in Mexico or really anywhere. It always comes with a price. For context, I didn't grow up in a good area. I won't give location for privacy, but I live in a fairly large city. At the same time I was around 10 or 11, this was overall not a good area. Lots of gang activity, drug use, that kind of thing. One of those neighborhoods with the jacked up sidewalks and the shopping carts strewed everywhere. There was a park a couple of blocks away from my house and I decided to go on a run and spend some time there on my own. I don't know why I was allowed to leave on my own. Knowing the area, it was still light out when I jogged down there, but it started getting dark. When I actually reached the park, it was around dusk. The layout of the park was a big rectangle, basically. It faced out long ways, so the shortest side was where the gate was. It's hard to explain, so I'll try to attach a picture to show y'all what it looked like. There was a set of swings at the very front, and I sat down to hang out there for a bit. At the time, I didn't have a phone with service. I just had music downloaded to listen to. I was sitting with my earbuds in and just got this really awful feeling. It felt like a tingling on my back and I knew something was up. I took one earbud out and kept swinging, but I couldn't shake that feeling. Finally, I turned around to check behind me. There was an alleyway leading to the park that curved so you could only see part of the way down. It was all white gravel. Down the alley was a dumpster. There was a figure on the ground with a ton of red stuff around him, which I know now was blood, and another guy standing, walking towards me fast. The alley was across the playground, about 40 feet away, maybe. As soon as I saw the man approaching me, I dipped the F out of there. He had something in his hand that I couldn't see, but he was holding it like a knife or a pair of scissors. I sprinted the couple blocks back to my house and got through the back to make sure no one saw me. I didn't tell my dad until years later and he fully believed me. That area was bad news and I'm amazed something bad didn't happen to me with how much I was let out alone. In 2001, I was sentenced to eight years in prison in Florida. A few years in, I got transferred to a close management camp, Florida State Prison. To make a long story short, I was given a job working on the wax squad. We would be let out of our cells at night to wax and clean the floors. Depending on who was working, we would be assigned wings to wax each night. The two best wings were G-Wing and X-Wing. G-Wing is death row and X-Wing is max lockdown. G-Wing being death row was usually kept clean and always quiet. X-Wing was small so not much needed to be done. Anyways, in December 2005, I was assigned to G-Wing and every night after finishing my work, the sergeant would allow us to run the wing and pass things from inmate to inmate. It was during this time I met a guy who called himself Doc. Doc would tell me about growing up dirt poor in Louisiana. While we played Scrabble, I got to know him pretty well, as much as one could. During the time we played Scrabble, I worked G-Wing for about a month. Before I got the news, I would be transferring back to a general population camp. It's pretty crazy 
that serial killers seem so dang normal until that switch in the brain clicks. Danny Rollins, aka Doc, will be put to death in 2006 for killing five students at UF in Gainesville. He was the inspiration behind the movie Scream. I hope you enjoyed the new video. Thank you to everyone allowing me to use their stories. Starting now, I will be releasing new videos every Monday and Wednesday at 1pm Mountain Time. And if you'd like to keep up with me, follow me on all my social media. Links in the description below. Now this is where I take my leave. And always remember, the truth is the scariest thing.